Not bright. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I mean, it's picked the right day for it, haven't we? <laughs> this week's been a bit miserable, but it's it's lovely today. I'm also feeling like I've picked the right week to have finished building my greenhouse at my allotment. I've been <laughs> doing lots of sort of hiding, putting on my seedlings in the rain. Uh, I have shelter now. But yeah, we are at Hollybush Conservation Centre today mm -hmm. on a beautiful sunny May day. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Freya. Oh, and I'm Alex, just about to jinx there. Um, <laughs> Oh, that would be a really awkward live stream when we jinxed each other at the beginning of the live stream. Like, sorry, we have to do the rest of it in mine. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm Freya. This is Alex. We are at Hollybush Conservation Centre in Kirkstall in Leeds, mm -hmm. um, working for the conservation volunteers as a, on a project called Green Gym. Mm -hmm. And we actually did, we did a poll this week, didn't we? We did, um, yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, we did it on the Twitter. We put out a poll because there's lots and lots of awareness weeks going on. There is. Hedgehog Week that the Hedgehog Society have been running and there is um is it it's just amphi hashtag amphibian week I was trying to remember what the hashtag was um which is about yeah amphibians so that's your frogs and your toads and your newts and then there's also we made a little bit of a blip on this one because someone sent us oh it's National Wildflower Week it is in America but so it's not actually National Wildflower Week in the UK. But what it is is May, which is No Mo May, which is um, a project that Plant Life run. I think it's Plant Life that run it. That's a project to encourage people not to mow their lawns or at least a patch of their lawns for the whole of May. Why and that, you, why would you do that? Oh, we'll get onto that a little bit later. But it's to let the wildflowers grow. So it is still to do with wildflowers. And there's other wildflowers we're going to take a look at. So it is a month that it is really important to be thinking about wildflowers and thinking about how those wildflowers and how that growth at ground level and above interacts with the other habitats around us. So, yeah, there's these three awareness weeks going on Which or awareness month. Poll? Which one won? Oh, it was so dramatic. I'm going to make polls more often because I had a great time. Um, it was completely neck and neck. So it was. 33.3% went to all three of them, and um, we're doing all three. So, yeah, we've decided we're going to do this. Because, um, yeah, we thought about it, and it was actually, they all interlink loads, yeah, don't they? They're all essentially, like, very interdependent on the others. Yeah. So we're doing a wider wildlife gardening live stream today, looking, yeah, at the things we've got here at Hollybush, which is a sort of slightly larger scale, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but, I mean, you'd be very lucky to have something like this in your back garden. Uh, you, I mean, you're lucky to have a garden, or but, yeah. yeah, I think if you had something like this. I think, I think we've got an acre. I'm told it's an acre, but I think it might be bigger than an acre, because it does I seem... So, yeah, growing space where it's definitely... Yeah. Lots of, lots of things going on. It, it does sort of narrow down to a point, but it's... Yeah, we've got quite a lot of space here. But there's a lot of these things that we're going to talk about today that you really can think about incorporating into... A really really tiny space we've sort of been talking about the things that yeah you can do even if you've just got a shrub yeah um we aren't going to tell you how to make a pond because we already did how to make a wildlife pond Several times. so well we've looked in our wildlife ponds at skeleton grange so if you head over to the skeleton grange playlist of the first close to nature videos we did on facebook they are on the Skeleton Grange Facebook page. They are on a playlist called Close to Nature. And there's a few on pond dips that we did there. But then we also did one that is on the YouTube, CCV YouTube and the Hollybush Facebook page and the Skeleton Facebook page, which is on how to build your own mini wildlife pond, which also, if you've got more space, it covers a lot of the features that you'd consider on a, in a bigger pond as well. We also did, slightly chaotically, how to build a hedgehog box. Oh, that was a fun one. Yeah, we if had... you watched that one live, you were probably laughing at us at the time. <laughs> we found out we had a slight technical glitch just before that one started. So we do run through how to make a hedgehog box on that one. But it was very, very, very last minute, the sort yeah. of prep for it. It's so. that it is live. Yeah. <laughs> So, but what we do have is we do have resources at TCB on how you could make a hedgehog box and the measurements and things which we can circulate in the comments or after the video. Um, 
the about how to make these specific things but we're going to look more about how you can embed these things in your garden and things to, to consider um around that we should say we've got in the comments we've got hazel who will be tech support so things will be popping up on the screen and popping up in the comments from us and that is hazel we do occasionally when alex is holding the camera get a chance to read the comments so do comment any questions any thoughts anything you've got in your own garden we love seeing pictures if you can but i think it's difficult to share pictures in the comments isn't it but if you can tell us about anything that you've got in your garden we'd absolutely love to see that yeah. um, and if you ask if you're watching this back and you're watching it back not live still put your comments in, and your questions in there because we can we still look at the comments and we can still come back and try and answer those questions for you so yeah we should probably actually look at the garden shouldn't we yeah yeah so should we get what are we going to begin with i think we should probably begin with this bed here because this bed here we were talking about it earlier it's it's just a vegetable bed this is actually the one that was built for our gardening courses that we're just starting up again at the moment at hollybush so normally this would be weeded and this would have vegetables growing in it we actually had a look at some of the stuff that's in this in the edible wildflowers uh, edible food um, things from your garden session a few weeks ago um and yeah this is jack by the hedge here and the reason we're looking at this is because there's been lockdown over the last year we've not been maintaining a lot of the areas of the garden we've been coming and doing basic maintenance we've been keeping the site safe but things like weeding the veg patch that we're not running a course in hasn't been a focus and this jack by the hedge it's edible it's garlic mustard is the other um, name for it it's part of the mustard family the brassica family um you can see it's little white flowers on this one quite well the little four petal flowers that show you it's quite possibly a brassica and the reason we're looking at this is you think of them in weeds in this setting and we've already shown you that you can eat them but we've been talking a lot of recently in the garden we've seen loads and loads of orange tip butterflies much much more than we normally see and orange tip butterflies actually lay their eggs on garlic mustard so by leaving these weeds weeds wildflowers and not pulling them we don't have, even in a conservation center where we do focus a lot on um, habitat creation just by not weeding the vegetable patches we've had a huge increase in the number of some of the populations of butterflies that we see we also had a brimstone butterfly that was flapping around a few weeks ago that it was beautiful they're bright yellow the orange white orange tip ones they're little white ones with just like little tips of orange at the end of their wings on the male you're, you're, you're less likely to find them in your own garden if you go on a walk in a wilder area like the woods or yeah meadow. or a holly bush or here. <laughs> so yeah that was just a little look of like explaining how you can reframe your ideas about what's a wildflower and what's a weed because quite often they are one and the same and thinking about how actually if you've chosen for it to be there it isn't a weed yeah, there's, it's there's, there's no such thing as a weed really it's yeah it's context it's like if it's in your veg patch if it's swamping out your cabbages then it becomes a weed but if it's just in the ground yeah so we do have poppies this does need a weed we are probably going to give this a weed soon because we are going to be the court as we said the courses have started up again but if you aren't using a bed if you're leaving it dormant if it's over winter leaving stuff like this just to grow if it's not going to seed it's really doing no harm yeah it's much better than it being and you can uh, you can always dig it in as a as a green manure oh, I so, a comment from, is, am i loud and clear now sorry i've got the mics on different time so. uh, okay so we're kind of coming around this is another bit we're just sort of revamping this section as at the moment because we're just starting groups up again we've got green a green gym just gradually coming back on site we've got the courses starting up again so we are now having to look at maintaining some of these um, areas for oh lots of pond skaters i should have let you come first so you could be the one that scared all of them away well you can see so around we're now at one of the, the ponds that we've done on the live stream quite regularly. But instead of talking about the pond and what's in it, you can see around the border of the pond here, it's completely wild. Like it's really sort of, well, you could say overgrown, 
but that's really important for Simon Gear. So we don't have any sort of grass space here at Hollywood, like Ray was saying. So we let some of the beds grow over, and then we let some of our borders also overgrow, yeah. which is really important for all the little critters and maybe because it's yeah something we get asked quite well. One of the most common things we get asked around sort of like. Oh, I'm building a wildlife pond. How can I get frogs? Where can I get some tadpoles? You can't. Don't get tadpoles. Going and getting tadpoles is one of the worst things you can do. Ponds are really isolated ecosystems. The natural movement of animals between them is really limited. And you, you get amphibians moving gradually from one to another. You may get the odd bird carrying something and dropping it in. But really, they're quite isolated, which means they have quite low defenses against pathogens and things and fun so fungus and disease so if you're moving um frog spawn and tadpoles from one pond to another you're just really accelerating this system of transmission of diseases between ponds so and also if you've not got the right habitat around your pond the things you're putting in it won't survive long term anyway so because yeah, Frogs and toads and newts don't live in the pond. They spend some of their time in the pond. They breed in the pond. They might hibernate in the pond, but they don't live in there long term. They have to be able to migrate. So what we're talking about today is this vegetation around the edges. So this is some of the wildflowers we've got. So we've got the marsh marigolds here. You can walk across this way. And we've got, well, the sort of bulrushes and things are just coming up. And we've got it. So it's this gradual bank so it's shallow at this end but then it's got vegetation that goes right out into the deep bits and also covers the shallow bits and then comes out into the sort of boggy area surrounding the pond and this is just really really important because it means that the tiny little frogs i don't know if it, the froglets when they grow up they've got a way of getting out of the pond and then by not mowing the grass at least in a corridor having ground ivy having a strip or like some sort of corridor that means those little frogs we've got a path here but if you look behind us like round us we've got all around here and then over here we've got the wildflower meadow that's not quite in flower yet but ignore this so this is where we've cleared the pond out a little bit but we've left that next to the pond so anything that was in it can get back into the pond before we put that in the compost but by having all of this it means that these little frogs can escape they can go somewhere so yeah we've got a few flowers coming out yeah it's quite an early flowering one deceptively it is pink yeah. but it's called red campion the, the leaves have a sort of scarlet yeah and then we get to the next one which is also confusingly named which is the green alkanet yeah. Yeah. to find out what this one is i googled not borage because it looks a lot like borage and a lot of people mistake I, it I did you morning. did this morning and i did when I, I used to have it in my garden when i first saw it i was like oh that's borage but no this is green alkanet so it is a part of the borage aci family so that's the family the sort of latin grouping the nomenclature that's the word isn't it that um borage belongs to so you've got your borage your comfrey i think long works in there as well mm -hmm. all of those ones with these sort of big spear-shaped leaves with lots of hairs on them but borage sort of comes up in a big rosette of big leaves from the base whereas the green alkanet sort of comes up the stem with the leaves sort of alternating coming off it and then the flowers are similar to borage but borage has sort of more teardrop shaped ones whereas these ones they're rounded at the end so that's how you tell that this one's green alkanet rather than borage i think also it used to, the root used to be used as a dye so that's why it's called green alkanet because obviously the flower is blue so it's used in dye i think from what i remember it's not a very good dye but it historically would have been used as a dye so that's why it gets its name I i'm not entirely sure why red campion is called red campion that's just to confuse you and i'm not going to walk across the meadow because we've got a lot of seeds sown in here that are just coming up we've got the cowslips here these are a nice one 
they're actually one way you can eat the flower, you know. Everything's something you can eat in my world. I'm going to eat one. They've got, feel me eating it. They've got quite a te like nectary taste. Okay. Go on, Alex, oh, give it a go. Yeah, I'm going to check any little bugs first. Nah. <laughs> You've got to be careful that it's not something like creeping comfrey. But these are part of the primula family, so they're related to primrose. They're quite a nice thing in, yeah, early flower in meadows and wildflower meadows. I'm, I'm fond of them. And yeah, we planted this a couple of years ago. So this wildflower meadow, it, it was there historically. It's been here for a while, but we re reworked it. Um, we took a couple of big trees that were overshading it and um, out last winter, a couple of winters ago. But then the garden group at Hollybush put quite a lot of work into rejuvenating it. So I'll talk through a little bit about what you do to make a wildflower. Because wildflower meadows are great. Wildflower meadows, if you're like, the soil's rubbish in my garden. That is exactly what wildflower meadows want. So while this wildflower meadow is a, a summer one, so it's the one that's in full sun, you can go on the website like Naturescape and they do loads and loads of different seed mixes. You don't just get wildflowers, you get, you can get a woodland mix, you can get a clay mix, you can get a chalky mix, you can get just a generic one, you can get a cornflower one, etc. cetera. Um, and what that means is you can be quite selective for the soil type you have, but they like low quality soil. So whereas the rest of the time you're sort of trying to add compost, you're trying to like improve your soil with this quite often, especially if you've got good soil, you actually take the top one or two inches of soil off the top. So we went around, we scraped this back, we took a load of the soil off and then you get your seed mix, you mix it with sand. And what that just means is because you get loads of seeds, so a handful of seeds it goes a really long way. So if you just sort of throw it out, what you'll end up is you get patch and patch and patch. You get some builder's sand or any kind of sand. And you could, you could probably even do it with sort of dry soil if you want, if you didn't have sand. And you mix it through in a bucket really thoroughly. So quite a lot of sand and your um, seeds mix really thoroughly through it. And then you just spread it out really thinly across the whole area. And yeah, you get a wildflower and this did look beautiful last summer i'll see if i can yeah. fish out some pictures of it to share with you to show you what this looked like last summer and it was quite disappointing and the team had put so much work into making it and then lockdown happened so it was only a handful of staff that got to enjoy it um but we so we sewed that you do the, oh so you can see a bee advertising what's all is it i can't see <laughs> who could that's yeah Oh, we should have done it. This is a challenge for you in the comments, has it? Oh, we need to post that video we took of one eating the sugar water, don't we? So, yeah, we should. I'll go back to when you sow them in a minute, but I think we should talk about the importance of them is as well as being the co ground cover. That means that amphibians and other wildlife can move around. They're also hugely important for Bees for pollinators as for other pollinators as well. So bees get a lot of they're the charismatic ones, but there's loads of others, loads of flies, loads of beetles, loads of hoverflies. There's absolutely loads of things that rely on pollen and wildflowers. I was listening to something recently. There was a, a, they were saying that we don't need more honeybees. What we need is more food for honeybees. So there's lots of sort of amateur beekeepers in urban areas that sort of massively boomed in recent years. And actually the problem is that there's just not enough food for them. So having, even if it's just a tiny little area for wildflowers is just really important because you can have ornamental flowers, but they tend, they're bred for the selected for um, the flower, how they look, they're selected for us, yeah. but the wildflowers really are the ones that are most, They've evolved together, so they are most suited for the needs of the pollinators that we get in our ecosystems. So, that, yeah, having a little segue onto pollinators, yeah. we've did this, the main bulk of the work, in 
ready to sow it in September. So we do, you do it in September, so the end, very late summer, which quite often that's when you'd be cutting back. I'll move on to the maintenance of them, though, in a little bit. But you cut them back at the end of summer, and then in September you sow the seeds, you scrape it across, and then a lot of the seeds sort of, you scrape it across and you get it slightly covered because otherwise what birds really like to do during the, um, oh, sorry, I'll pause while there's a, we are right next to Lee's Bradford Road, so I'll pause when there's a, I can't think there was a police car by the sounds of that one. Um, yeah, in September, you put the seeds down and then you leave them over winter. And you know what birds really like to do over winter? Eat absolutely anything they can find. So it's important that you do sort of scrape it over a little bit just to get the seeds just under the surface of the tilled soil that you've got. And a lot of those seeds rely on being sort of frostbitten over winter. So it's quite important that you try and get that cold period over winter to get some of the seeds to germinate in the first year. But if you've missed that, that's OK. April because also some things in the seed mix if you then have a really wet soggy winter with loads of snow on the ground and then they get really damp they're more likely hello little blackbird demonstrating our lovely ecosystem uh, <laughs> like so some of them will rot so what I would normally do is I would normally do the bulk of the sowing in September and then in April or March, I would come back, depending on the weather, depending on if it's warmed up, if the ground's unfrozen. So this year, the season is so late, I'd even be, cons I'd still feel relatively comfortable doing it now because yeah, everything. I, I a little while ago. Mm, uh, yeah. And like, it's going to do a lot better in the ground than it is out of the ground, yeah, is the yeah, it... general <laughs> principle. <laughs> so seeds don't last forever and you may as well give it a go. It's still spring. And yeah, the whole growing season is really late this year so, because we've had so much cold weather. It was so dry last month as well. And now with the rainfall and everything is when things really are starting to germinate. So re -sow, maybe save a quarter of your seeds until the spring and then re -sow them again. I put down a load of poppy seeds that I'd saved from the veg patches last year. I spread that out on here. So hopefully, I mean... If you look closely, you can see there are loads of plants coming up. A lot of it's ground elder. That's that's the ground elder. But yeah. <laughs> if you come here, you've got like a little bit better variation. Oh, we've got a wild geranium. We've got lots of the garlic mustard, actually. So this is an example of the garlic mustard over there is thought of as a weed because it's in our veg patch. But here... There's absolutely no harm with it being here. I've got some hogweed, some thistle, not necessarily what we want to encourage most of. We've got the plantain there, I think it's hoary plantain. Dandelions, <laughs> also a wildflower. But like, as it's a summer meadow, so as the summer comes in, this will grow right up and we will come back and have a look at this because it will be worth looking at in the summer. Um, we also have a woodland meadow that is at the far end of the woodland. You do get seed mixes that are for, yeah, for woodlands. Should we look back and just quickly look at this bush and then go up into the yeah. woodland? Uh, if you don't have any big have a wild colour, you have a crack or not. So if you have a crow, push for a small tree, this time of year, flowers, and that is all part of what that no more effort is to keep these on your shrubs because I mean, they're really important for I, yeah birds. I don't know if you can see there's just so much stuff that sort of yeah there, I mean there's I think we've just scared most of it off of flies lots of little tiny pollen these are quite small flowers yeah is my my microphone's playing up today is it second. is mine all right I think so mine is just... it is it not just that I'm talking loads I don't know hold on <laughs> Oh, I think. Should I keep talking while you try and figure that out? Do you want me to hold the? So we'll take a look in here. So it's really important. Yeah, you're doing no mow, but you've got these bushes and these shrubs. This isn't a native one. This isn't a wildflower exactly. But this is another thing that you can consider how 
um, you could not cut this back. So if you put, oh, there's a tiny little spider there. I don't know if you can see the spider. Right, I've reset my microphone. Oh, yeah. Hopefully you can hear me now. I don't I'm know what's... I'm zooming on this spider with my really, really unsteady hands. Ooh. Doesn't want to focus on it. Oh, well. I'm trying. There's a cool little spider on that um, flower. So this is just... If you then have these, if you have bought something that has berries that are good for birds, good for wildlife, if you cut off the flowers... You not only cut off the things that are good for the pollinators, but those mm. flowers are what will produce those berries. So this is the time of year that it's really important to think about not disturbing this. So try and do your cutting back of hedges and things over winter. And actually, that's not just a case of that's all nice for the pollinators and nice for the birds in winter for, so they get their food from the berries. It's actually the law. So it's illegal to cut back a hedge or a tree from the 1st of March to the end of August, if it's got any sort of active bird nesting in it. So I bet there's birds in there. Like I'd, yeah. I'd be really surprised if there isn't a nest in mm. this bush because it's a quiet area. So, and it's dense foliage. I would guess there's a nest in there. I just remember Russell, that was just me kicking a stick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that'd be amazing if the birds sort of just went <laughs> out of it. But yeah. Don't be cutting your hedges during the summer, during the spring. You might be able to give them a little bit of a trim on the outside, but really try and leave those flowers, try and mm. leave those berries, try and try and leave those nesting animals in peace in the middle. So that one's not native, but it was quite a good example that we can see of something that you could have in your own garden. We've also got, in terms of wildflowers, they're not just on the ground. They're not just in a wildflower meadow. Mm -hmm. They're around the edge of the pond. They're around our borders. If there's bits that you don't need... To maintain, don't maintain. There's them. there's no harm at all in letting it go wild. You might want to maintain it slightly more than this. This is a work in progress <sighs> that we're um, rejuvenating at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, but if you're, you're saying it's not only the things on the ground or in bushes, what else? What else would have wild flat? I think there might be some right behind your head, actually. Yeah, there we go. So this is one of my favourites. It's a hawthorn. We've talked about it extensively as a tree. It's super versatile we can eat it animals can eat it and it produces these beautiful white flowers that then turn into the red paws see if the camera can focus <laughs> there's been a lot of technical difficulties today so yeah it's got hundreds of thousands of these tiny little white buds that we turn into really bright white flowers and then into red paws that again we talked about the reason that they're red is they catch the eye of the birds um and yeah the birds all love eating these. Gets its name is because the berries are called Hawes, H A W. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like they're in loads of hedges. So if you have a look at our how to plant a wild uh, native hedge, they mm. are one of the key things that I will put in a garden hedge. I've actually planted one up in my allotment because mm. they are edible berries. Um, they grow thick and spiky as well. Thick and spiky. Yeah. Blackthorn can send out suckers that can mean that mm. it um, isn't necessarily great if you've only got a small garden. But if you, because it can kind of take over, it's a thicketing um, plant, which means it's a really good edging species in woodland and it's really good at stock proofing hedges, but it's not necessarily the best for your own little garden hedge. So we're coming through to our woodland now. Oh, here. So even if you've got deep shade, there's still options of, oh, we may have walked past a good one, of things that you can plant. So yeah. you've got loads of trees. There's still stuff that you can plant that pollinate, are great pollinators. And a great for early pollinators. So you can see back there we've got our bluebells. Mm -hmm. um, so because leaves come on trees, like it's kind of if you look up, you can see the leaves are on some trees are fully out, on others they're not quite out, but they are starting to come into leaf. A lot of the bulbing plants mm -hmm. of woodland um, flowers, so you, the ones like your daffodils, your snowdrops, uh, you can just the wooden enemies, anemone, anemone. Is just starting to die back, but that's been beautiful for the last couple of months. Yeah. We've got our wild garlic back there, it's just coming into flower. So these woodland floor ones, because they need to get sunlight, they rely on photosynthesis to get their energy, like most flowers do, like most plants do. Um, they come out really early. They come out and they get their leaf. They get as much of their energy from before the um, leaves come on the trees. 
so we're just kind of yeah the, the bluebells um are kind of one of the later ones to come into flower of the woodland floor species and they're pretty beautiful they're pretty yeah they're almost sort of synonymous with woodland aren't they? yeah like the, the bluebell woods that sort exactly of exactly that i don't know if you, have you ever been to proper blue, bluebell woods where they're just huge swathes yeah. of them and it's just like there was a thing i was reading the other day where people were just what's the collective nouns for bluebells i vote with mist because i was thinking of them as being sort of a, this sort of hazy blue purpley mist mm. across the floor of the woodland a carpet of bluebells a carpet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. that's it it's um in terms of wildflowers you, t- you can think outside the sort of wildflower meadow things they can be beautiful you can just i said you can get the mixes you can just get really specific flowers like if you really love poppies you can just get poppies mm. yeah you can see all of the buds of the wild garlic i'm going to put some to put in my lunch and then we come to the sort of more woodland appropriate bit which is our habitat area which i think looks pretty lovely yeah <laughs> There's one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet, which was hedgehog awareness, wasn't it? Hedgehog awareness week. So that's kind yeah. of the focus of this area. This is, ah, oh, we should have said this at the beginning, but why should we be trying to look after hedgehogs? Why should we be trying to look after frogs and toads and, amph- and newts and amphibians? Like, what do, what do they do for us, Alex? That's what well, it's, all, it's all about perfect levels and things like that. Like, you know, you, you look after the small things. So you look after the wildflowers because they're the first thing. And then they look after the pollinators, the bees, the insects. And then things like amphibians will eat them. And then so on and so forth. And so, in fact, actually, we found out, didn't we, this morning that hedgehogs will eat turds and things. Yeah. So that everything's linked. There's lots of different trophic levels. So there's lots of food chain. So you've probably done food chain in school. Everything's linked together. And if we lose one of the links out of the chain, the chain becomes weak and then, you know, it all comes falling apart. And a lot of our species are endangered. Hedgehogs are listed as at risk of extinction in the UK. Um, We've we've lost a bunch of hedges, haven't we, over the past hundred years? In agriculture, we've gone from sort of smaller... Um, patches of land bordered by hedge to now huge acres and acres, he- massive areas of just sort of rapeseed or, you know, without any sort of bordering hedge. And it's in the name hedgehog. They like to live. They like undergrowth. They <laughs> like this cover. They like this shelter. And we're talking mm. about the stuff around the edge of the ponds being good for amphibians. It's yeah. also good for hedgehogs and birds and things to get in and be shielded from predators. To, to eat the free. amphibians. <laughs> to eat the toads. Um, <laughs> nature the circle of life <laughs> <laughs> but, um yeah they also if you're like well why do i want to encourage hedgehogs if you, if you're not doing it for wildlife for wildlife's sake mm. if you're getting annoyed that all your hostas keep getting eaten by your head by your slugs what you need to do is you need to introduce predators and introducing predators is introducing your amphibians it's introducing your frogs and your toads and your newts and your hedgehogs yeah. and all of these eat the pests that impact your crops it's uh, biological pest control isn't it biological rather than using yeah. harmful chemicals you're introducing a natural predator and then they there's no risk of hedgehogs becoming a pest themselves i don't think like they're yeah. endangered i think the, the the more we can uh sort of encourage the species to rebound the better because it's that's it it's like ecosystems are designed to be balanced and if you take the balance out if you remove the top we're talking about the trophic levels if you remove the top predator i don't know if i quite call a hedgehog an apex predator i don't think that's oh, they're, you know they're, they're definitely a secondary predator <laughs> of things like slugs and amphibians yeah they're yeah. a predator if you take out the predator you just get more of the things that they eat that's mm-hmm. that's how it works so by encouraging these hedgehogs by encouraging your garden to support this biodiversity um you are encouraging your plants to do better So a way that we can, we've talked a lot about this, so a way we can support hedgehogs is giving them a place to be, to hibernate and to seek refuge. And we've kind of pointed, we did how to make the, we talked about our chaotic live stream the other day, (laughs) but um, we've pointed in this general direction and we've talked about dead hedges. So dead hedges are something, this isn't necessarily the neatest one, you can make, 
really neat one. That one over there is looking quite pretty. Yeah, I got I have a wonder. <laughs> so these are a really good way of combining several functions in a garden. So as well as First of all, being a way that you can get rid of sticks. You, so if you've got any woody material that doesn't go in your compost, because you don't want to be putting stuff that's woody in there, or you don't want to be putting stuff like ivy that might spread through the compost, but by making a dead hedge. So what we've done is we've got these stakes, stake, 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 made a corridor of stakes, and then you get all of this woody material. You cut it right down, you get it as straight as it can be, you want to get rid of as many side branches as you possibly can. And then you just sort of interweave it in between the two, the two rows of sticks. And this will rot down over time. It makes a really good way of getting rid of it. It makes a barrier. So this is quite a good way of we've got our nature area here. Then we've got a seating area here. It kind of it makes quite a nice natural looking barrier. But it also and it gets rid of our waste. It also makes a habitat corridor. So. It means along here before we put this dead hedge in, this was just a long straight wall basically. It's the ivy wasn't particularly growing up this bit. The it was just a wall, it was pretty stark. So by putting this row of stakes all the way up here, it means that we've got a habitat corridor. So a habitat corridor is a way that wildlife can move without having to go out into the open. So it means that all of these little critters can um move up and down without having fear of us of humans getting run over sort of oh i do I'm, I'm getting there i'm excited for this so <laughs> so this is i talked about the robin landing on my hand last week this is another point in time where i got to feel like i was a disney princess and wow disney princess controlling nature so one of my volunteers was going but it is just a way of getting rid of rubbish, really, isn't it? I'm like, no, 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 it's really good for habitat corridors and for the little mouse. At which point, a little wood mouse scuttled up the dead hedge and scuttled all the way along it. And, yeah, it was pretty magical. It was as though the wood mouse was like, yes, Freya, I will demonstrate this wildlife corridor to your group. <laughs> Think about it like a, a, an underpass or an overpass. You do not want to walk across the road. So they put bridges or tunnels in that's exactly what I was to say, we've got things like this that's our dead wood pile. So it's important that you do just have things that you let rot. Mm -hmm. So this is because things like it, we're going to add some more wood to this that's slightly fresher. But having these things that have fall apart, the um, what's the word? Dendro, dendro. No, not detritus. That means wood, decaying wood. Dendro means wood, basically. Um, dendrophilic, that's, oh, I can't remember. The things that eat wood is the word I'm trying to remember, but I can't remember it. But um, yeah, as it rots down, it still, it provides a valuable habitat for um, those things. But yeah, add fresh stuff as well. And you just find a corner, like it can look really quite nice. We've got these mossy logs. It does, don't look at that. That's a bit of a shame. So but please bear in mind that we have been um, largely shot for the last year. We've not yeah, had our normal volunteer groups. groups. Yeah. So a lot of things over the last year have got slightly more ramshackle than they might have otherwise been. So there are a couple of bits that normally there'd been a group of 30 volunteers coming through every week and maintaining it. But we've not had that for the last year and a half. So do bear with us. But it is looking lovely. Look at the ferns. They look good. They did that all by themselves. Yeah. But that bug box is part of the Great Outdoors Wood Squad. They are were in the process of making a new one to replace that. So the Wood Squad will be fixing that because you do want to replace the sticks and things in a mini beast hotel fairly regularly. So we talked about the head and why that's great for all mammals. But hedgehogs, if you live in quite an urbanised area and there's lots of pet cats or lots of things, then you probably want to introduce one of these. So this is a finished hedgehog box. Not the one we made in the live stream. Not the one we made in the live stream. This has been made by Tom. Um, yeah, and the Wood Squad. And the, and the Wood Squad, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's, it's relatively small. It would fit in any sort of size garden, maybe. If you've got uh, a space, that, a, a quiet corner in your garden, not in the centre, is but if there's a small little corner of the garden we 
sort of built this one into the, the dead head. You don't have a dead head. Yeah. Put them in a quiet, so put some sticks or something over the top of them. Do try and embed them. See, so we've got some sticks under it. Put some bricks or something under it to lift it off the ground so the base doesn't get damp. And this one's really quite, I'd say it looks lovely, like it's, it's nice wood. But if you're not into that sort of aesthetic, that you can get ones in different shapes. You can get one in different styles out of different materials. You can paint them. You don't want them to be in really garish colours, but you could paint like a little design on them. You can make something that even if you've got a beautifully paved patio that you don't want loads of sticks cluttering up the space, you can have a box that can look really quite nice to anyone's eyes, I would say, to, yeah, allow a place for them to go and hibernate, to go and shelter. So it's summer now, so they're not going to be hibernating, but to go and breed in. We've only just put this one in this morning because it would need, the old one needed replacing. But, yeah, it's a nice little thing to yeah. slot and in there. The, when, we, when we were replacing it, there, there was some evidence that there had been some activity in the previous one. There'd been some leaves dragged in. It was quite flattened as well. Something had obviously been. Yeah, something had been lying in there. Um, you know, you, you you should always check before you remove your head cover by putting something in front of the doorway, something like a, a pile of leaves or something. If that gets disturbed, it's highly likely that there's something inside. And then if that's it, you leave or try again later on. Um, it's super important to not disturb them. Yeah. Um, Don't be vulnerable and. Uh, you know, they, they want to learn. And if you want to encourage them, disturbing them all the time is one of the worst ways to encourage them. You're just going to scare them off. Like It's so tempting if you think there's something in there to be like, oh, I'll just have a little sneaky peek. Don't. Don't do it. Don't do it. Do what we've done and discourage yourself by putting stuff on top of it. So even if you wanted yeah, we, to... we can't open this, yeah. which is a good thing. Yeah. So, oh, I'm losing my microphone. So, yeah, there's... We've also we don't have an example of little um, doorways for them, do we? That we because that's something that you could put in a your fence and something at home is to make little sort of ten centimeter diameter holes. I don't know, if, go with fifteen or twenty, I'd say. So they definitely will fit. Yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, you can make little doors in your fence that just allow them to move around because the the range that they travel is surprising. They go, they don't just live in one garden. You really need to be sort of encouraging your neighbours to do similar things that will also encourage them because otherwise yeah they just they won't just survive in your garden they just need unless you've got a massive garden yeah if you live in a highly urbanized area which a lot of uh, position this one a lot of them do then, yeah they're not gonna they can't fly so they can't come from somewhere really wild and then come into your garden but if you root them by wild eventually you know, patience is the first yeah. The same with all the different So amphibians as well, they push a fly, so they're not going to just come from uh, a lake or a pond nearby. But if you give it time, you grow up some space around the pond, you can uh, naturally introduce the fish. So you can set the fish there. Then give it time. Or more than likely, you eventually get to so this is an example of something where if you had a fire corner of your garden so this one isn't set in a head you just put to one side and in a way you can kind of forget about it then so you don't have to constantly go up leave it be yeah and if you can try and put it in a shady space you don't want it in full sun because if it's in full sun when a, a winter day, it will just warm it up too much if it's a sunny day. So you want to make sure that the co the temperature is fairly constant with the air temperature so that they're only coming out of hibernation when it's actually warm enough. And there's Because they do, hedgehogs sort of come in and out of resting over winter. So if it, there's a warm day, they'll go out and hunt for some food. If there's yeah. a cold day, they'll stay sleeping. So uh, Hibernation. I recently found out hibernation doesn't necessarily mean that they just sleep like a log over winter. It's that their metabolism slows down and their heartbeat slows down. Yeah. And they do wake up and they will 
go out and get food. Is it turpo? I, can't, I think that's the so, word. Yeah. So I always thought when you think hibernate, I always thought it was to slept for winter, but obviously that doesn't make sense. And then you find out that bears don't actually hibernate. Mind yeah. blown. Yeah. I can't remember what the last... Basically, there's nothing bigger than like that big that actually hibernates. Like, there's a difference between hibernating and just resting loads over winter. So most of the larger things that we think of as hibernating actually just rest yeah. loads, like me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they don't want to expend all their energy. Yeah, when there's very low food yeah. source. So, yeah, in the shade, lifted off the ground a little bit, as sheltered as you can make it surrounded by as much sort of habitat cover as possible habitat corridors so they can move around putting little gateways in your walls having ponds so they've got a place that they can go and drink having those slopes and cover around the pond so things can get to and from the pond and right up to the edge of the pond without getting impacted by or threats threatened by predators having your frogs and your toads and your newts able to get in and out of the pond not mowing your lawn. Yeah, yeah, try give it a go. Give no mummy a chance. Even if you can, even if you don't, you, if you've got kids that you want to be able to sit on the grass in May and you're just like, but I really, I really, really value my lawn being a lawn and I just really like using the lawnmower. Have a little patch that you mow that you actually, that you use for that. But then even if you just bring it in a metre and leave a row around the edge or a strip that goes to the pond or back from the pond then or into the woods or yeah. something then like that will just infinitely increase the yeah. something is better than nothing yeah. yeah and having grass just grass in your lawn that is a monoculture of one species that really does very little good yeah. for many things and i've been seeing sort of i've been looking at the twitter uh uh, when I've been revising for this and uh, there's been lots of things about people just talking about the amount that their lawn and the, the amount of wild animals, insects and bees and butterflies and wildflowers that they're seeing just from a couple of years of every May, just for one month, not mowing their lawns. And if you've got a bush that produces flowers and berries, not cutting it back hard, cutting only cutting it back over winter. Look at the look. At, I mean, you're unlikely to get bluebells in your lawn unless you put them there. Yeah. So I think that's probably us coming to an end now. Yeah. I hope you found it interesting. Do let us know if you've got any questions. There's some beautiful flowers. You know. Oh, they are lovely, aren't they? I think next week is Mental Health Awareness Week, isn't it? So we'll be back again with another live stream looking into, yeah, how it look at connecting uh, nature and the green space around us into how we interact with it for our own well-being, I guess. We've not quite planned it fully yet, but we'll, of course we have, we're so prepped and ready yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, i hope that you found that interesting i uh, hope that you've got the information you wanted if there's anything about yeah building a wildlife pond or we actually got more on meadows as well mm -hmm. than in the summer we've got last year's videos on the skeleton grange facebook videos list um we've done making a hedgehog box so do look back through our catalog of videos that we've already made for more in-depth information and yeah, it is International Compost Awareness Week as well, which we've not even talked about. Sorry. But if you want to listen to us talk for over an hour about compost, there's also a video for that. <laughs> so that was actually, I think, one of our more popular ones, wasn't it? We've yeah, had quite a lot yeah, of yeah, people yeah, have yeah, come back yeah, saying. Very informative. Like, yeah. Quite, yeah quite so thank you very much for joining us. And I've been Freya. I've been Alex. You might not have been able to hear me on live stream. My microphone has been really playing up. Okay. So. I think mm. you've been picking me up with Freya's microphone. I'll really? look into that before next week. I'm really sorry if that's been happening. Uh, oh, it might be, you know, you might have enjoyed it, to be honest. <laughs> it's a bit of a change. It used to be before we got the microphones, it was always me that you guys couldn't hear. Yeah. So, brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. And we will see you next week. Take care. Thank you very much.